Okay, and uh, hopefully everybody made the jump okay. Um, so our final session of the day, um, from measuring fast warming Arctic regions to quantifying human contributions to climate, um, uh, the, the United States and its allies are taking a bolder stance on confronting climate change. Uh, our final session for the day is novel missions, partnerships, and platforms for climate research. Uh, this panel will take a look at what is missing from our current observation toolbox and the novel missions, platforms, and partnerships that can complement existing observation systems to better inform scientists and decision makers. Thank you again to our day one sponsors, Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory, KBR, and SAIC. Our moderator for this panel is Eugenie Uzkirchen. I, I think I messed that up again. Sorry, Eugenie. <laughs> um, and uh, she's an associate professor at the University, University of Alaska Fairbanks. So Eugenie, turn it over to you. All right, yeah, thank you, Jim. I think you gave a, a good introduction in terms of talking a little bit about what this session is focusing on. So as he said, this is a, it's a session focusing on, on novel missions. And it's a chance for you to learn a little bit about new data that will be coming online and um, some focuses on technological solutions as well. So we have five panelists and they're gonna talk for about five minutes each. And so that means you have 35 minutes for uh, questions. So please be thinking of your questions as our panelists are talking. And so with that, I will uh, turn this over to Cassie Eli, who is the director of Methane Set. Hi there, thank you so much. I didn't realize I was going first. <laughs> All right, here we go. So uh, I'm Cassie Ely. I am from MethaneSat LLC, a subsidiary of Environmental Defense Fund. And today I'll be sharing a little bit of the technical technical capabilities of MethaneSat, but I'm not really from the tech side of the program. So I'm going to focus more on what's unique about what it is that we're doing and, and what really we're aiming to do. So next slide. So for those of you who don't know, methane is an extremely potent, invisible greenhouse gas. It's 84 times as potent as carbon dioxide in the first 20 years after it's emitted. And more than 25% of today's warming, of the warming we're experiencing today, is from anthropogenic methane emissions. So about a decade ago, Environmental Defense Fund started seeing that more was needed to understand the scope of the methane emissions problem. There was a significant lack of data. So in 2012, EDF began a research study to um, assess the emissions from the oil and gas, the US oil and gas supply chain. And that culminated in the largest body of peer reviewed research on the issue. Now, synthesis of that research showed that the US EPA had underestimated the oil and gas industry's emissions by 60%, so really significant numbers. Now, to reduce methane emissions in a meaningful way, what we need to understand is the location of the emissions the amount of the emissions and track that data over time. But availability of reliable methane data is a problem worldwide globally. And a lot of places that produce oil and gas um, and therefore methane emissions are really hard to access. So EDF and its partners began wondering whether remote sensing and new technology could be a way to gather that emissions data we were looking for. Next slide. So cue methane sat. Um, MethaneSat is a low Earth orbit satellite that will detect, measure, and quantify methane emissions worldwide. It will quantify methane from high emitting point sources as well as cumulative emissions over the smaller sources that are responsible for a larger share of the total emissions, so what we call the fat tail problem. The uh, satellite itself is equipped with methane and carbon dioxide imaging spectrometers and they'll operate like an inline camera scooping across a 200 kilometer swap clip. Now we're prioritizing about 200 oil and gas production facilities, and we expect to see about 10, um, we expect to see each of them about 10 to 20 times a year, really depending on variables like cloudiness or, or other you know, weather related issues. Um, we're planning to make all of the emissions rate and other data 
public. We're funded by private philanthropy, and we figured that was one of the best ways not only to serve our um, donors, but also to get the data into the hands um, of the people who can really uh, use it best to, again, make it actionable. We expect data flowing from the satellite around three months post-launch and uh, will be launch ready by the fall of 2022 and have approximately a six month launch window with our launch provider, SpaceX. We have an incredible team developing the science and building and operating the satellite along with us, including Ball Aerospace, who's helping uh, build the instrument, Blue Canyon Technologies, uh, now a Raytheon company that's providing the bus, and we have some really unique partnerships with, for example, the Government of New Zealand, the Ministry of Business, Innovation, and Employment, to build and operate the Missions Operations Control Center. Next slide. And what we've learned from previous projects is that getting from concentration to leak rate of methane set is really important to making the data actionable. Now, um, in terms of kind of the comparison, um, I'll give you a hypothetical. So for example, you could have a small leak show up at a high concentration because there's not a lot of wind or any other type of like movement. Or you could have a really leaky um, area, a very large leak in a super windy corridor where the concentration would be dispersed and you wouldn't necessarily know to target that bigger leak. So what we've done is we partnered with Harvard University and researchers there have developed an automated inversion algorithm to calculate the flux rate as well as identify the changes over time. So instead of getting just a snapshot of what things look like in the moment, you actually get more of a movie. And you can run it backwards to figure out where the methane is actually being emitted. So by automating this data analysis process and creating a state of the art data platform as a hub, we'll be able to provide continuous, near continuous, streamed analyzed data. Now, our data platform will be cloud-based, um, both for the satellite operations as well as the data analysis. And it's estimated that approximately um, one petabyte of data will be generated per year by these efforts. In addition to the data analysis platform, we're also designing an interface and dashboards for several different audience types like policymakers, the oil and gas industry, the science community, among others, to provide information and insights not currently available. Next slide. And lastly here, you know, we're part of a complementary landscape. As you can see here, our other greenhouse gas measuring satellite colleagues have different spatial niches. Methanesat has finer resolution than Tropomi or GoSat, for example, but wider coverage than GHGSat, which focuses more on point sources. And what this means is that our satellites can all work together to tip and cue each other based on the strengths of each of our specifications, um, all for the betterment of the climate. So thank you. Thank you, Cassie. That's great and nice overview. So let's um, move on. And next we have Uwe Nod. He's the program manager of the German Aerospace Center. And he'll be talking about um, a mission in his department. Hello, everybody. It's good to be here. And uh, as the program manager for DSIS, I'd like to point out a few facts and give you an overview of the DLR Earth Sensing Imaging Spectrometer. Next slide, please. Here you can see on the left where DSIS is located. We are on Express Logistics Carrier 4, but between us and the space station is the MUSIS platform. So later on, he will talk in his presentation a bit more about the MUSIS platform. And at this point, I need to uh, thank Heath and all of his team for the perfect cooperation. So thesis wouldn't exist without the MUSES and we have a great partnership. On the right, you can see a few figures. Don't be scared. I won't go too much into detail, but what's important is that we have a ground sampling distance of 30 meter and a spectral range of 400 to 1000 nanometers and a spectral sampling of 2.55 nanometers. That's really yeah, unique as a hyperspectral mission. Next slide. Please remember the 235 spectral channels. That's a direct result of the 2.55 nanometer. I will talk a bit more later on about that. Next slide. 
Yeah, here you can see our thesis products uh, after the raw data take, which might be a long, a very long data take. Uh, we do different scenes. Uh, we separate into the level 1A archive uh, where we prepare the data. Um, then we go to the level 1B top of atmosphere. And uh, after that, we can um, have the calculation for the level 1C uh, geocoded and auto rectified data package which you can see on the left. So um, we sort every pixel to uh, the Earth information data. And here you can see one data tile and mapped into Google Earth, into a Google Earth scene. That's possible and it works perfectly. And after that, we get the level 2A product with the bottom of atmosphere correction. So uh, there we calculate uh, atmosphere into our data take. Uh, and that's the normal product you have after that. Uh, you can have several applications to, to do specific things. Uh, but also we offer different masks. For example, if you want to work with water, you can get a water mask uh, just to focus on your main research work. So I won't go too much uh, into detail with all the other masks, but, but that's what we offer. Next slide, please. So with the spectral range of thesis, we monitor vegetation, soil, and water because it's uh, very good to do that with our spectral range. Um, so this is also uh, ideal to monitor the effects of climate change. So we do a lot of monitoring, uh, but also analysis um, for climate research. But uh, for us, it's important that we only do climate monitoring and not climate research. We have other institutions in Europe, Germany, and in the world uh, where they work with that data. Next slide, please. So here we have an example what we do as researchers with uh, all that data. On the left side, we have four tiles. The uh, top left tile is the multispectral image. Um, as we have 235 channels, we can uh, put all different slices together of our data cube. That means we have 235 different views on in one scene. And here we have four of them. Uh, the multispectral is uh, likely what we see with our eyes. Uh, then the PV is the uh, vegetation on photosynthesis. That means uh, normal uh, vegetation that's living. Uh, then we have the non-photosynthetic vegetation likely after drought or uh, if you had, have that vegetation uh, and uh, down on the right we have um, the bare soil so we can um, identify the material that's on the ground below you can see that also in the curves we have different signatures that will be shown in the different curves uh, does this work here with vegetation but also with any other material that's that has its spectral range uh, and our spectral range, so between 400 and 1,000 nanometers. For example, USGS was able to detect uh, rare earth elements for the first time from space with thesis data. But there are also different effects that we can monitor. On the right, you see the fluorescence maps of vegetation. Uh, on, on the left part of the right picture, you see uh, just uh, one leaf, one single leaf. It's invisible to see that effect with our eyes, but this is can. So um, you can also see um, fields uh, in, in that view from space, and you can uh, detect whether vegetation on ground is stressed or not. And below you can also see the, the O2A band, which detects that. The problem is that uh, ozone is also in that spectral range, but since thesis has 235 spectral channels, well, we can separate that. So um, on the curves, you see the, the green part, which is vegetation, and the blue part, which is oxygen. Next slide, please. Yeah, we are not a mapping mission, so we, we didn't already uh, record the uh, whole Earth, uh, but uh, we have uh, acquired 50 million square kilometers worldwide, um, but also many scenes in the United States and Germany. 
so we have a lot already in our archive. Uh, we we'll rely on tasking so any user can task the scenes they need. And uh, this works so far quite well. Next slide, please. So we um, do have a small scientific program for that, but this is as, as a multi-purpose instrument, a lot of more possibilities. And here you see a few examples uh, of uh, proposals that we got from others. We need uh, proposals to do a scientific partnership, but um, a, a lot of scientists around the world are working with thesis data. Uh, so it's possible to get thesis data if you have a, a scientific proposal for us and uh, it gets accepted. Uh, we have to make sure that we don't do any commercial things. Uh, that's the business of Teledyne Brown Engineering. Um, but uh, many scientists uh, are working with our data uh, and uh, it's great to see the uh, good results. Next slide, please. And if you wish to, to know more about this, follow the link or use your mobile phone with the QR code. Um, we have uh, also a section for data access where everything is described how to get data for science. Uh, and that's what I wanted to show you. Thank you. And so I hand over back to Eugenie. Terrific. Thank you, Uva. And so now following on from, from Uva's talk is, is um, Keith Lester, and he's going to be talking about the MUSE's uh, mission, and he's from the Teledyne Brown Engineering. Thank you, Eugenie. Uh, Good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, great to be here today. Um, as been said, I'm going to talk about Muses and uh, a little bit about DASIS. Uh, Uva, Uva, Uva has already touched on DASIS and the applications. I'll touch a little bit about uh, the operations of it. So uh, uh, next slide, please. And so Muses itself, a multi-user system for earth sensing was born out of uh, a call by NASA to further commercialize uh, the International Space Station. Um, so Muses itself is a, a pointing platform, a precision pointing platform that uh, is two gimbal. Uh, so we can go forward and aft and, and cross track of the ISS. Uh, in cooperation with NASA, we designed this system. Uh, and its intention uh, is to kind of marry the commercial and, and scientific uh, side of the houses uh, for a low cost, minimal contract to launch duration uh, to provide that either just space access, uh, exposure or um, actual earth observation from the International Space Station. Um, we do, as you can see in the picture, the, the diagram or the graphic up at the top right, uh, we have uh, the capability for uh, four different uh, installed instruments we call hosted payloads um, and one of the benefits we have of our system is they can be removed and returned for uh, analysis or reuse they're robotically installed uh, by the ISS robotics team uh, of course uh, launched uh, in one of the launch systems uh, pressurized and then they're remo removed uh, inside of station and robotically installed out of the airlock um, Again, a lot of the benefit is depending on, on the requirements, uh, our system provides that, that resource, uh, the resources, power data, et cetera, that um, uh, provide a benefit over traditional free, larger free flyer missions that, that can uh, uh, cost uh, a, a good deal and, and require a lot of resources, both monetary and, and physical. Um, so we provide that that capability uh, and perform the operations like we are with uh, DASIS uh, that Uva uh, mentioned uh, currently. Um, so at the bottom right, uh, some of the characteristics of the Muses platform, as I mentioned, we, we do have gimbling capability, which has provided a benefit uh, over, you know, just purely nadir pointing, whether it's free flyers or other station uh, payloads that we can uh, minimize any impacts of orbital shifts or things of that nature by still being able to point over to a, uh, a location for an area of interest uh, up to 45 degrees across track. Um, next slide, please. So with the ISS, there are both benefits and, and challenges. Um, with the benefits, we, we do cover 90% of the populated Earth. Um, as you can kind of see in the graphic there, 
a lot of the orbital track, uh, a lot of uh, obviously ocean uh, uh, access, uh, but a lot of land access. Um, so we have a lot of coverage of the tropics with uh, good revisit times for off an uh, off noon, allow for reduced cloud image acquisitions. Um, but that that revisit time has a beep frequency, as I mentioned in the challenges there, that it kind of depend on latitude. So you could go uh, a day, every other day of having an access for a few weeks and then, you know, maybe a month, not have something and then come back to that same type of beep, beep frequency. Um, we do a lot, uh, we are able to uh, collect acquisitions at different times based on the ISS orbit. Um, which allows for uh, obviously different times of day uh, collections, which is useful for BRDF for diurnal dynamics. Um, with, like I mentioned before, with the robotic capability of the install and, and removal um, and, and launch and, and return, we, we provide a, uh, a mechanism for um, upgrade or repair exchange of instruments as you know as it says there's tech technology or markets evolve um, so with all that being said it, it kind of reduces a lot of the traditional barriers that have been been there for um, sensors or scientists to get their their science uh, in space to uh, acquire or have that space exposure um, and as you can see again in the diagram uh, the coverage there we, we are challenged by the orbit and the fact that uh, we, we cannot get above 55 degrees north or below 52 degrees south in latitude. Uh, next slide, please. So as Uva mentioned, uh, our first hosted payload was DASIS. Uh, it's been, uh, in, in my opinion, an overwhelming success. We had first imagery within 24 hours of, of install and, and checkout. Uh, we launched in June of 2018. Um, we do have the commercial rights to imagery while DLR retains the rights for scientific use. Um, but as some of you may be aware and, and actually involved with it, uh, we have an agreement with NASA for image or data purchase. Um, so we have many, many uh, NASA scientists and, and, and uh, principal investigators uh, using DASIS data uh, now as part of a commercial agreement with NASA. Uh, Uva touched on this uh, earlier, but 235 bands, 2.55 nanometer sampling, uh, 400 to 1,000 nanometers, and a, a, a GSD of 30 meters with the ISS orbit at 400 kilometers. Now, ISS has been flying a little bit higher than that, so the GSD is, is slightly uh, larger. Uh, with DASIS, they, uh, there is a, 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 a pointing mirror uh, that allows for BRDF and stereo acquisitions. Uh, we haven't necessarily got along to that point of really uh, perfecting uh, those um, options um, and we're continuing to work those uh, on an ongoing basis. And again, as Uva touched on, um, there's several levels of processing available depending on, on needs um, that are listed there with radiance, the rectified radiance and surface reflectance. Uh, next slide, please. So as, as part of the overall system, uh, we, we've developed a, a mechanism for both uh, 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 retrieving, uh, processing, and delivering uh, that data. And uh, we touched on it earlier with a system we call T-Cloud. It's a cloud-based data management and distribution system for uh, currently as we use a geospatial imagery data. Uh, it allows uh, users to come in, place an order, whether it's tasking or archive order of the existing data, uh, and then that data is processed and delivered to them through the user interface. Uh, with that, we can support, uh, as I say, countless other systems or uh, future hosted payloads uh, for that data uh, hosting, uh, processing, and delivery. And we can uh, process data in multiple ways. Uh, currently, like I mentioned, we've processed the basis data uh, in the different ways, but uh, we have uh, multiple options for in in line analysis and, and other processing. Next slide. So uh, to just wrap up a, a few resources, if anyone's interested in, in looking, you can uh, go look at the uh, T Cloud system that we have. There's a guest uh, log on login option. You can see the basis data that's currently in the archive. 
Uh, and then if you ha have any further questions or need information about uh, Muses or DASIS, we have the geospatial site there for TBE. Uh, you can go there and my contact information is out there, but uh, it's also below for any operational uh, type questions there. And then our current uh, in-house technical um, uh, subject matter expert uh, regarding DASIS data and calibration questions, uh, Kara Birch there and her contact information is there. And uh, with that, I will hand it back over to Eugenie. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank, thank you, Heath. So we're going to go now and hear about GeoCarb from Barry, Barry and Moore, who's the principal, principal investigator of um, GeoCarb, the Geostation Carbon Observatory. And he's also director of the National Weather Climate Center at Oklahoma University. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to be. Um, Presenting, as we just said, the GeoCarb mission with my colleague, Sean Crowell, who's my deputy. And we're at the University of Oklahoma. Next slide. Uh, this is a truly uh, team effort. Um, um, we have um, Goddard uh, is uh, the manager now for the program, JPL Ames, Colorado State does a lot of the data processing. We have European partners uh, also, um, uh, in uh, University of Melbourne uh, in Australia. Next slide. Here's the um, challenge that we face, I think, in trying to understand. In fact, a number of these missions are trying to get at the same problems. How do we really understand what the carbon and methane cycles are doing, their expressions of the carbon cycle? And, and they each have their own peculiar problems. Uh, uh, the top slide uh, shows uh, in the gray there, the fossil carbon emissions. And you see a rather smooth uh, inclined upward curve that is essentially the industrial revolution going all the way back to the eight, uh, 18th century. Uh, we started burning uh, fossil fuel. Uh, the atmospheric increase uh, is jagged. Uh, the, uh, that's the um, below. The, Carbon that is emitted to the atmosphere stays in the atmosphere. Some goes in the land, some goes in the ocean. And the apparent unevenness uh, in the uh, annual increase in the atmosphere can be traced back to an, uh, an, uh, a jaggedness, a, 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 a variable uh, sink in the terrestrial biosphere it's not in the ocean, it's in the terrestrial biosphere. And this is a real puzzle as to what is causing that. Methane, on the other hand, has another problem. Uh, we saw a rather rapid increase uh, up until around 2000. And then the atmospheric concentration of methane leveled off for about a decade. And now it's increasing rapidly again. Why did it level off? Well, we really don't understand. So these two major greenhouse gases have, have a lot of uncertainty about them, uh, but we certainly all know that they're greenhouse gases. Let's go to the next slide. So uh, on average though, you have this in terms of the uh, carbon cycle that about 46% stays in the atmosphere. About a third of the carbon is, that's emitted uh, from fossil fuel burning and land use change uh, goes back net, net into the terrestrial biosphere. And about 23% goes into the oceans. It's that 31% that has the variability and that we really need to understand. Next slide. So what GeoCarb is really gonna go after uh, these uncertainties associated with uh, methane and CO2. And we do, much like methane sat, we measure the concentration of CO2, methane, and CO in the atmosphere. And from that concentration measurement, uh, we can back out uh, the sources and sinks. Uh, I, I think as we, it was put beautifully on methane that we run the motion picture backwards. So we could essentially do a data simulation or an inverse calculation to get to sources and sinks. Uh, we actually measure not only just the total amount of CO2, we're really measuring the concentration. We measure the total amount of CO2 in a column of air 
uh, divided by the column of air, and we get that by backing out the concentration of oxygen. It turns out that that concentration of oxygen, as we just saw a few moments ago, that also uh, gives information about solar-induced fluorescence. So we're going to be making daily measurements at about 5 to 10 kilometers over the Americas between 50 degrees uh, north to 50 degrees south latitude, daily at about 5 to 10 kilometers. Next slide, please. So the, the real role of, for, for, for um, GeoCarp is this geostationary orbit. And what I would like to see is a ring of these uh, geostationary platforms. One at, say, uh, the Grand Meridian, one at about, oh, say, 60 or 70 degrees east, and one at about 110 east. Uh, you, with four satellites, you could get truly a global coverage uh, between the 50 degree uh, north-south latitude. And the advantage of geostationary is this observations that are spatially and temporally dense. Next slide. Here's the instrument. It's a uh, four channel uh, spectrometer. Uh, the lower left is the way it'll actually be flying, uh, looking downward. Um, and uh, it measures roughly about uh, 1.3 meters in each direction. And it's about 160 kilograms, uh, has about 10 megabytes per second data rate, which gives us about 10 million soundings a day of concentrations of CO2, methane, and CO. Next slide. This gives a feeling for how this works. The key element of uh, geocarb is that we scan along a, in a slit. I'm going to project that slit down onto the Earth's surface in the Mexico City area. And that slit uh, is the orange. Uh, we stare for about nine and a half seconds. And then we move the slit over uh, and stare for nine and a half seconds. And then we move the slit over. The slit, if you look to the left hand side, is about 2,200 kilometers north south. And then we can position that slit anywhere over the Americas and essentially sweep out CONUS, sweep out Brazil. Uh, and this gives you kind of a feeling for the density of measurements. For instance, uh, OCO, and we would not be flying if it were not for OCO2. OCO2 provided all of the basis for this instrument. So OCO2 goes into the Mexico City region on, say, day one, and that's the green swath. Eight days later, it comes back to the Mexico City region. That's the right-hand slot in green. Eight days later, back on the left-hand slot. The advantage of geocarb uh, is that it will map out the Mexico City area. It will map out CONUS. It will map out Brazil every day at about five to seven kilometers uh, northeast, southwest. Of course, that varies as you get off of uh, into an angle. Next slide, please. So we began life as a uh, Earth venture, and we, uh, at a certain stage, uh, felt that it was wisest if we moved to more of a, a directed style of mission. Uh, we started with uh, University of Oklahoma and myself as uh, the management lead, and uh, at a certain period, we felt that to go forward uh, successfully, we really needed uh, the help of the Goddard Space Flight Center. Uh, the PI, myself, is still in charge with the scientific leadership. Uh, we remain on track to be, I believe, it to be a transformational carbon mission. And like these other missions, this clearly is a mission of the times. It is the mission of today. Next slide. So thank you. And I would like to say I'll see you at the American Meteorological Society meeting in 2022, which I think will be the first time that I will be out of Zoom land. So I look forward to talking to you, hopefully, at AMS. Bye bye. OK, terrific. Thank you, Marion, for laying out the carbon cycle. So now we're going to move a little further north. And Ray Nasser is um, going to talk to us about the uh, Arctic, Arctic Observing Mission, the AOM. And he's a research scientist and principal investigator of the AOM. Um, he's also at the Climate Research Division and Environmental Climate Change of Canada. 
Okay, thanks. Um, as you heard, I'm Ray Nassar, and I'm going to take a few minutes to tell you about the Arctic Observing Mission, or AOM. Next slide, please. So, as you probably know, the Arctic is changing, and in fact, it's changing more rapidly than other regions of the Earth. Arctic temperatures have increased about three times the global average, and this is a trend that is expected to continue or probably even accelerate in the future. The temperature changes that are happening in the Arctic are linked to other processes and other components of the environment. And just to highlight one example is that as temperatures in the air increase, permafrost is beginning to thaw. And this permafrost thaw results in the emission of greenhouse gases, CO2 and methane. The amount of carbon in the permafrost is about twice as much carbon as we currently have in our atmosphere right now. And best estimates suggest that a small fraction, perhaps five to 15% could be released by 2100. This, this emission of these greenhouse gases basically creates a feedback loop as the gases are released, they cause more warming in the atmosphere and, and that warming releases more gases. Fortunately, it's somewhat offset by increasing vegetation in the Arctic that also is occurring as the temperatures warm, but it's really difficult to predict how those various factors will balance out in the future. So we, we really need better data to monitor and understand the changes that are happening in the Arctic. Next slide, please. So uh, the focus of my research is on greenhouse gases and, and I'm looking forward to working with the greenhouse gas observations from low earth orbit missions like MethaneSat and also geostationary missions like GeoCarb. But the truth is that the, uh, previous slide, please. The truth is that these, these missions from LEO and GEO don't really address the needs for observing in the north. And LEO and GEO satellites together are a powerful combination. Meteorology has used LEO and GEO satellites together for decades and our, our modern weather, fast weather forecasting relies on this, but they do leave a gap in observations over the north. And you could see this in the figure on the left, which shows the GEO ring for weather satellites that Barian basically alluded to um, that he hopes to see for greenhouse gas observations one day. And these, these observations coming from multiple countries provide observations with high revisit rates. However, they're restricted to a region from approximately 60 degrees north to 60 degrees south. And that's because geostationary observations are made from an equatorial orbit in which the satellite is basically locked over a position on the Earth as it's synchronized with the Earth's rotation. So, so while it's a very powerful approach for achieving frequent revisit, it leaves a gap in the high latitudes. And this can be addressed with a highly elliptical orbit. Next slide, please. So let me just quickly tell you how this orbit works. Basically, in a, an elliptical orbit or any orbit, angular momentum must be conserved. And so as the satellite is very close to the Earth, it moves more quickly. And when it's farther from the Earth, it moves much more slowly. And near the farthest point from the Earth called the apogee, the satellite effectively dwells there. And it could give us geostationary-like observations if that orbit is oriented with an inclination to, to place that apogee in the high latitudes. So with a 16 hour period of the orbit, you'll get a ground track such as that shown in the middle as the earth rotates below. And from the apogee points, the three points that are um, where the satellite basically loops around on its ground track in the north, you get very favorable viewing angles of the northern regions as shown on the right. And Canada has ex explored this approach extensively in a number of peer reviewed publications that are listed at the bottom there. Next slide, please. So the payloads that we'd like to see on the Arctic Observing Mission include a next generation meteorological imager 
And the NOAA ABI that was developed by L3 Harris is shown as an example here on the left. We also would like to make greenhouse gas observations. And we've been studying a, a technology known as an imaging Fourier transform spectrometer or an IFTS to make similar observations to, to those that GeoCarb would make measuring CO2, methane, CO and solar induced fluorescence over cloud free land during daylight. However, with this technology, we, we expect to be able to get rapid enough revisits that we could deliver hourly data for most of the year. We are also exploring a UV visible air quality imaging spectrometer and a space weather instrument suite. Next slide, please. So I'm pretty optimistic that this mission will happen, but I will say it's not approved yet. We believe that the way forward for the mission is through an international partnership. And NOAA, NASA, and UMETSAT have explored the idea of HEO missions for meteorology or space weather in the past. And Environment and Climate Change Canada, where I work, as well as the Canadian Space Agency, have been in partnership discussions with these organizations since about 2019. We have letters of support from senior officials within these organizations confirming their interest in AOM. And we hope that this can set the stage for future commitments and participation in the future. Right now, the mission is in phase zero, and we hope to seek Canadian funding commitments and commitments from our partners around 2024, aiming for a launch in 2032 and a 10-year mission. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ray. So it looks like we have about um, 15 minutes for, for discussion and for questions. Yep. Uh, Eugenie, did you want some uh, audience questions at this point? Yes, that would be great. Sure. So um, a question about methane set. Um, so can that be, I think you said um, it, there were 200 uh, sources that you, that you mentioned. Can it be redirected towards other sources or, you know, look broader? Yes. Yeah, methane sat has the capability of looking at a bunch of different types of anthropogenic sources of methane. Um, another area we're looking into actually with our partnership with the New Zealand government is agriculture. And they have some science uh, studies going on there, some research projects um, to explore how to use the methane set algorithm for those types of sources. Um, so as that kind of further develops, we'll be able to target based on those research needs. Got it. Great. Thanks. Um, mm -hmm. Question on uh, muses. Um, can muses observe a specific target over a period of time, or is it um, just a snapshot uh, kind of platform? Uh, I think the answer is yes to both. Um, but <laughs> we, we can uh, we can plan targets for acquiring an area of interest. Uh, now it won't hover there, but uh, you know, as as overpass opportunities occur, we can we can collect that data um, every time, uh, depending on the tasking priorities. Gotcha. Um, speaking of priorities, so uh, did you, did, were there four payloads available on Muses? Is that what I saw? Yes, there are okay. four, four possibilities. One is being taken now by DASIS, so there are three others. Uh, there's uh, slots for two larger type hosted payloads, uh, supports larger power draw, large uh, footprint. DASIS uh, is taking one of those, uh, so we have one other large and two smaller uh, hosted payload slots. Gotcha. And is there, and so you're just uh, anticipating demand for, for that going forward? Is that kind of the plan? Okay. Yes, gotcha. uh, we've, we've had uh, uh, ongoing discussions with uh, a few different uh, organizations for uh, future payloads. Gotcha. And I guess a question comes along, you know, about um, prioritization. Um, so we're looking at a broad scope at all of these uh, possible missions, these, these novel missions uh, uh, for studying climate research. How do we prioritize, how do you prioritize 
uh, which ones should be, um, you know, to, to rise to the top and be made a, more of a priority um, at, at, with respect to funding, development, you know, technology. And this is this is for the panel. So I'll just put it out there. Don't be bashful. Maybe I'll Ray, Ray, you look like you're going to speak up. Yeah. Sure. So it's a great question. And I think, fortunately, we're not the first ones to have to try and answer it. I, I mean, there are um, studies out there like the decadal survey, for example, that tries to prioritize what types of observations are needed to address earth science questions. And then there are also international bodies like CIOS, the Committee on Earth Observation Satellites, that tries to coordinate the efforts of different countries to address the biggest gaps that, that are out there. And so I think um, there, are, there are people working on answering the problem about where the gaps are that need to be addressed. And, and I guess I'll relate that back to AOM and, and the idea of orbits. So there, there are um, a lot of satellites in low earth orbit and, and they give us great data. But really, if we start to think outside the box a little bit and consider different vantage points like an elliptical orbit, we, we really start to see how the different vantage points are complementary and, and we can address gaps from that approach. So I guess I'm saying rather than doing the same thing over and over again, it's, it's great to explore new areas. Anybody else? All right. Um, here's an interesting uh, thought um, that might be a little backwards and it ties into uh, our previous session about data or a pre an earlier session about data deluge. You, you talked about kind of the, the, the rewinding, playing it backwards to see what we've got. Is there enough data to actually kind of make that happen and, and to, to get enough information to do the rewind and see you know, the progress of any given uh, climate development or climate change. Um, I don't know. Uh, Bar Barian, uh, what, what do you think? I, I, is, is, is there anything? That, uh, one of the things we re have to recognize is that once we start measuring something from space, um, we rarely want to stop measuring something from space. And, and there have been some remarkable records. Uh, the Topex Poseidon dates to 1992 we started making sea level measurements. And that continues today. I mean, with, with uh, Sentinel-6 Mike Freilich uh, on orbit. And, and so I think what this says is that we are beginning to build up that, that reservoir of, of knowledge. Uh, if it weren't for the Keeling record, which began in the geophysical year when Sputnik went up, the Keeling record, which is the measurement of CO2 at Mauna Loa in Hawaii, if we didn't have that record, uh, there would be no uh, climate program. I mean, that record is really the foundation on which we have built the climate program. So I think that one thing that, that space agencies may need to begin to think about is that once they start measuring something, it's probably not going to stop. And therefore, maybe you should buy multiple copies of the instrument at the get-go and see if we could actually save some money. But we really are building up that, that reservoir of knowledge and, and, and uh, we have to recognize how valuable this is going to be going forward. Anybody else? It, so that's a really good point though, is um, redundancy, continuance, longevity, uh, you know, so it, it, with, with the duration of some of these missions, you know, uh, uh, different so different subject where you get into servicing, refueling, things like that. But what's the what's the process for um, evaluating the success of something to then look at follow on to it uh, to either you know put up a put put up a duplicate or 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 do a, you know do an improved mission after it? What's the process for that? How does that happen? Uh, Heath, you, you got anything on that? Uh, well, as I mentioned in my presentation, that's where we provide a lot of benefits because obviously with, there's not many options uh, for 
really servicing free flower missions. So we have that, that capability for uh, providing that mechanism for uh, further upgrades at a, at a lower cost. Um, you know, as far as free flyer missions go and, and their follow on programs to upgrade, I, I really can't speak to that. Uh, maybe Barry or, or Ray or Cassie could speak to that, but. Uh, okay. Anybody else? Well, we certainly know this, that, uh, that the weather satellites have made a uh, dramatic improvement uh, or weather forecasting. Uh, uh, I mean, there's been several studies that really demonstrate uh, that, but particularly for instance, the lead time prediction uh, in the Southern hemispheres was uh, now approaches that of the Northern hemisphere, but for a long time it lagged because the Southern hemisphere uh, has a very large amount of ocean and therefore the observational density was not sufficient. But then as the satellite era comes in, then that observational density becomes the same and the predictability for Southern Hemisphere weather improved dramatically. Uh, I think we just have to recognize that is the earth on which we live in. And uh, we, I think the weather is just such a classic example of, of how things have gotten better. Hmm. Particularly severe weather. Uh, it really is dramatically improved. Mm -hmm. Excellent. All right. And so I've got another a question from an attendee here, and I'm going to read it uh, verbatim just so that I get it right. Um, Given the renewed focus and commitment to carbon emission reductions and associated international plans for operational carbon monitoring, could uh, Berrien or Ray speak to sustained operational carbon monitoring and how this data can be used by decision makers? So Ray, we'll start with you. Sure. So I think um, what the person asking the question is, is probably ref alluding to is the European mission called the Copernicus CO2 Anthropogenic Monitoring Mission. And so this is a constellation of three satellites that is really dedicated to monitoring anthropogenic carbon dioxide emissions. And I think, um, you know, the Copernicus program is an operational program coming out of Europe um, with some international partnerships, but, but basically it has that operational focus. What we're seeing in many other places is more of a, I guess, a, a less coordinated approach to these types of carbon observations coming sometimes from NASA research missions, sometimes from other sectors like the NGOs and even commercial satellites, um, all of these can, can give us valuable data that can be used for carbon emission monitoring that are complementary types of observations. But, but as we work with the available data, we also start to understand more about really what we need to get at point sources of either CO2 or methane or perhaps um, quantifying emissions from an urban area. So um, I, I think the, the positive point is that we're getting a lot of different observations from a lot of different satellites and, and, and observing techniques that will help us improve our understanding of carbon emissions. But, but really only Europe is at the point where they have a dedicated purpose-built type of operational constellation for monitoring. I would just add that, that certainly the rest of the planet is going to need to have that capability. And that one of the challenges, for instance, on CO2 is that what we're seeking to do is eventually to stabilize the concentration in the atmosphere. To stabilize the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere, you've got to cut industrial emissions by plus 90%. And that's going to be very difficult. So if it, the but in order to stabilize the concentration, that it's going to require something like a 90 plus percent cut in emissions. I think what's really going to have to happen is we'll probably not get that far down the path, but we're going to need negative carbon emissions. We're going to need systems that take CO2 net out of the atmosphere. That's going to require very, very careful measurements and monitoring. If, 
if, if we begin to go down that path. And I think we're probably gonna have to. So the, the carbon monitoring system has to come into existence that is a global monitoring system. High latitudes, low latitudes, all uh, uh, phases of the planet. Uh, this is just unavoidable. We have to have a, an operational carbon observing system, just as we have an operational weather observing system. All right, <laughs> thanks, Marion. We have just um, three or four more minutes left here in our session. I had one question I near and dear to my heart is, um, what do you see in terms of the linkages here between um, these missions and various ground measurements that might be important to make for calibration and validation exercises? I'll let others go, but it's absolutely central for GeoCarb. I mean, we're gonna look at uh, TCON, the Total Carbon Observing Network. Uh, we're gonna look at underflights as uh, LEO missions go uh, underneath us. Uh, this kind of cross calibration ground uh, truthing is absolutely essential. And this is Kathy. I concur with uh, with Barry in here. You know, for for methane sat, we've actually developed a uh, kind of a proof of concept called methane air, which is an aircraft equipped with an instrument that has similar spectroscopy as uh, methane sat to do some of that rigorous validation and calibration beforehand. Um, methane sat is also using TCON and I believe CO2 con um, and methane air is using the um, EM27 also. So it's just a constant um, validation across board. And this is Uwe. Uh, we spend a lot of effort on calibration and this is very important also to have uh, ground measurements and uh, to find out if you are still on the right track. So uh, we still have as a constant uh, task to monitor what's on ground. And on the other hand, we also try to fusion our data with other missions. Uh, there's a lot of AI work going on. And in the future, I think uh, the best picture of our planet will be coming from several missions from different satellites and a lot of eyes that are looking on the Earth. Right. Any other thoughts there? Yeah, I think, you know, I think too with ground measurements, it's important to consider. I, I, we were talking about how the data become more valuable the longer the measurements go on, but um, I think the data become even more valuable the longer both the, the ground measurements and the, and the measurements from space occur concurrently. That's what I'm thinking too. One thing that I think we have to uh, look at and be concerned about is that uh, the number of uh, stations in the Southern Hemisphere, uh, ground stations, uh, particularly the upward looking ones, it's pretty sparse. And um, we're need, we need to find global approaches to this, uh, these ground-based measurement systems because they really are essential. Right, yeah, good point. So I think, um, we we're about out of time. I don't think uh, we have any more time left. Is that correct, Jim? Yep. Yep. No, nope. we're in great shape. Yeah. So uh, uh, with that, thank you so much. Eugenie, any last words? Oh, no, I just want to say thanks. It was really, really interesting for me to hear about all these novel novel missions that are becoming available. And I will be looking forward to hearing more as they, as they move further along. And thank, thanks so much for everyone's time today. Indeed. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. We'll be keeping an eye on these for sure. Uh, hopefully we get to hear and, and learn a lot more about them going forward. Um, so, yes, thank you so much to Eugenie and the panel. We appreciate it. Um, and so that's it for our first day. Today, we, uh, with a lot of these, uh, with our panels and speakers, we got to look in, you know, take a good, careful look at how we're looking at Earth and, and what we're learning from that. Tomorrow we'll be looking around, uh, looking out a little bit further, uh, you know, moon, Mars, our solar system. And then day three, we'll be looking to look even further out, uh, space telescopes, exoplanets, things like that. Uh, so please do come back for those. Um, with that, uh, I would like to thank once again, our day one sponsors, uh, Johns Hopkins uh, University Applied Physics Laboratory, KBR and SAIC. And then thanks to all of our event sponsors, 
uh, Aerojet Rocketdyne, the Aerospace Corporation, Ball Aerospace, Blue Origin, JHU APL, KBR, L3 Harris, our education sponsor, Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, SAIC, Teledyne Brown Engineering, and our media sponsor, Space News. Uh, thanks to everyone at the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center for uh, helping us put this together. Um, and I will take one opportunity here for the students that are still online, please get in touch with me. Uh, we have an exclusive opportunity for the students on Thursday during the lunch break. Students only will be able to talk uh, with Thomas Zerbukin and Dennis Andruzik during the lunch break. Uh, and again, thanks to L3 Harris, our education sponsor for helping facilitate that. Um, so with that, we will see you all tomorrow at 11 a.m. Eastern for another great day, starting with our keynote speaker, NASA Climate Science Advisor, Gavin Schmidt. With that, have a great afternoon and take care. Thanks. Hi, everyone.